Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be looking at parapsychology from a skeptical perspective. My guest, Professor James Alcock, is a fellow and member of the Executive Council for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, formerly known as SCICOP, or the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal. Dr. Alcock is a professor of psychology at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He is the author of Science and Supernature, a critical appraisal of parapsychology, as well as parapsychology, science or magic. He is also a co-author of An Introduction to Social Psychology, and most recently, Belief what it means to believe, and why our convictions are so compelling. Now, of course, as a parapsychologist myself, I am far less skeptical about parapsychology than Dr. Alcock, but this interview is not a debate. I'm not here to score points against Dr. Alcock. I don't expect to win him over to my point of view, and I don't think he expects to win me over to his point of view either. But my goal as the host of New Thinking Aloud actually is going to be to help Dr. Alcock explain his position as completely as possible. The interview is being conducted via the internet, but I have a new setup in the studio now, so I'm going to remain here as I uh, connect to the internet. Welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. You are a member of the executive uh, committee of the or the executive council of the committee for skeptical inquiry. Could you let let's start by talking about that organization and what its purpose is? Okay, Jeff. What happened? Uh, this goes back some time, nineteen seventy six, I think it was. Um, there was a burgeoning interest in the media and in society in general in all kinds of. Um, I would say crazy notions, the notions would appear crazy even to, to respectable parapsychologists. So, for example, I remember a case of a judge somewhere in the southern states using astrology to, to uh, meet out sentences. He would look at an accused or a convicted person's uh, horoscope and, or, or, or sign, and on that day, um, some airlines were starting to use biorhythms, this, this strange system that supposedly measures emotional, physical, and, and uh, uh, spiritual, and other sorts of things to decide when its pilot should fly. Uh, and, and the thing was that there was, there, was, there was no critical commentary in any of this. And so uh, I was at that time interested in the psychology of belief and, and why people believe in anything, uh, let alone things that are a little bit more unusual. And uh, I had been in contact with a sociologist, Marcello Trizzi, in the United States, who, who was also interested in such things. And uh, he invited me to this meeting at the University of Buffalo, uh, where the, this Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, then called the Committee for the Scientific Investigations and Claims of the Paranormal, a real tongue twister, uh, was formed. And that, that first meeting, the whole notion was, somebody has to bring some 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 critical vetting to this, and uh, and and that's how it began. And of course, immediately um, it 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 set up a problem in that um, people who were conventional parapsychologists, I mean, people with with actual training in in in, in research, uh, saw us, I think, as a threat. Uh, maybe not completely without without uh, justification, because I think some of the people involved. Uh, tended to use a very broad broom to sweep anything and everything. And, and so it could be people who believed in unicorns to people who believed in, in uh, ESP. It was all indistinguishable. But that's how, the, how it began. Um, and one of the, the big accomplishments, I think, was the establishment of the Skeptical Inquirer. 
And uh, it, I think, has done a really good job of providing to the public and to anybody really in the media who's interested um, different ways of looking at, at extraordinary claims. Hmm. And, and from my point of view, I think the most important accomplishment has been that now I, I get calls from the media. Sometimes they don't quote me correctly. Sometimes they'll give me uh, one sentence out of a, 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 a whole article. But at least they're, they're looking for uh, um, information that might counter some of the claims that, that people are making of extraordinary nature. I seem to recall the phrase used by, uh, I think it was Martin Gardner, who was a member of, of uh, the group. Uh, he referred to the rising tide of superstition. That's, that's right. And, and in fact, it really was, uh, it was interesting to see because scientists were not speaking out at all. They said this stuff is nonsense. Why should we? Why should we dirty our hands? So it, it it left the field wide open to the purveyors of 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 nonsense. And and I mean, as as you know, there's a whole dimension there from people who are seriously trying to find evidence of of psychic phenomena to people at the other end who are are charlatans pushing wonder cures or or levitation or whatever. And and. And the, the, no one was challenging this. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've always felt, I've said this to some parapsychologists, I felt that, that not only had the scientific community ignored these things, but so had the parapsychological community. There, there was no one that I know of who was speaking up and saying, okay, ignore all that nonsense. Uh, and so, as I say, the purveyors of nonsense had, a, had, a, had, a, had an open uh, uh, feel. No one was opposing them. And in fact, it's, as I recall, there seemed to be a sense in the skeptical community that uh, by its very existence, the field of parapsychology was sort of providing cover for or justification for some of the more outrageous claims that were being made. Well, I, I think that happened. I don't necessarily blame parapsychologists for that, but I mm -hmm. think if you had some outrageous claim and someone uh, did criticize you for it. Well, you could say, well, look what's happening at Duke University. They take this stuff seriously. Yeah. So, so it, it did provide cover whether the parapsychologists were, were willing to give that cover or not. My experience in the parapsychology community has been in, in general, uh, at least going back, let's say, to the 1970s and 80s in particular, parapsychologists were particularly hostile to anything uh, associated with the occult. In fact, I argued, and, and other parapsychologists, some of whom are more prominent today, have argued that parapsychologists went overboard in, in their hostility to various popular mystical movements. Well, that's interesting that you say that because I, I, I think this, there's always been a divide mm -hmm. uh, uh, between the, quote, skeptics and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the parapsychologists, and, and we see the world differently, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, you know, I, I think, and I, I hope, I hope at least uh, in, in my uh, later years as a, as a skeptic, I've, I've been... Uh, I have appeared less hostile to those in parapsychology who have who have who have opposed this nonsense. Um, partly because I've come to know some parapsychologists personally, mm. and I think what happened back in those days, very few par very few parapsychologists had much to do with quote skeptics and vice versa. Yeah, and uh, I can still remember the first time I went to a parapsychology conference. I my my reception was. <laughs> People were not very friendly oh. for the first half hour. Mm. I mean, they said some things that were, I thought, I've got to get out of here. But after a half hour or so, the, 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 the personal interaction started to take over, and I found these people very charming. Mm -hmm. And I hope they found the same. And in fact, I became good friends with, with one parapsychologist and, and uh, uh, you know, developed respect for uh, the, the, the efforts of people who were genuinely trying to apply science. Mm -hmm. But I guess getting back to my, my main point is the two groups didn't know each other very well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, on each side, there were hotheads. I mean, there were some people in, in PSYCOP who uh, use words like nonsense, garbage, and so forth to describe efforts uh, by parapsychologists. And there were some parapsychologists. Uh, I mean, I was personally attacked in a number of occasions. Um, 
uh, in ways that were, were not very very nice. So so mm-hmm. you you mean it, verbally, of course. Verbally, of course. Yeah, <laughs> no. or, or perhaps psychically. I don't know. I had some back pains from time to time. I wondered where they came from. Uh huh. <laughs> was that psychokinesis? I don't know. Uh-huh. Well, in other words, you're willing to formulate a hypothesis that might involve a parapsychological element. Well, at least at, at least for for uh, for good humor, yes. Uh huh. Okay. Well, uh, let's talk about skepticism. My understanding is uh, uh, that skepticism was a philosophical movement in ancient times, and the purpose of it was to avoid uh, reaching any firm conclusion, but always questioning any conclusion that you might come to. I think that's true, but I've, I've never seen, I've never wanted to be limited by what philosophers have, have, uh, have defined. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, that kind of skepticism isn't very useful. I mean, my skepticism has always been, uh, let, let's, let's look at the evidence. Mm-hmm. So, so if, if uh, if you if you have a claim that you can make uh, um, baldness go away, for example, uh, let's look at the evidence. And as you know, there have been claims over the years. People have some magic formula that's supposed to work. But uh, but but you or I and others would probably say, okay, but we want we want evidence for that. And I say the same with parapsychology. Yeah. And and what and, and and Jeff, here's an interesting an interesting question. At least I think is interesting. Uh, and I had this conversation with a parapsychologist some years ago. Um, if, if he said to me, "What would it take to convince you that that psi is real, that psychic forces are real?" And I said, "Well, um, I can tell you what would easily convince me. Uh, now, if 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 uh, if if the parapsychological phenomena are so ephemeral, maybe they couldn't achieve this standard. But I think scientists would be readily convinced if." There were replicable experiments that could be carried out by neutral scientists, and they didn't simply involve statistical deviations because statistical deviations say nothing about the cause of them. Right. Right. So, so I said, you know, if you if you uh, suppose in principle you have uh, some kind of highly sensitive uh, physical scale. I mean, scientists use these in laboratories, yeah. and you isolate it from everything you can think of vibrations. Or, and so forth and so on, and someone, uh, or perhaps different pe- people, can reliably get it to, to, to deflect simply by staring at it. I mean, obviously, one such demonstration wouldn't be enough, but if you could do this repeatedly, then then scientists would take interest and, and say, what's going on? I said, on the other hand, let me pose you a question. Yeah. I said to him, what would it take to persuade you that there's nothing there? And he thought for a moment, and he said, Nothing. There's no one. You, there's no. There's nothing that would persuade me it's not there. I know it's there, mm-hmm. and so nothing would. And, and that to me is is the interesting question. Uh, formal parapsychological research has been on for over what 130 years or something. Yes. Mm-hmm. The 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 uh, the fruits of those labors uh, are, are are hardly monumental, and yet people still devote their careers to this pursuit. And and nothing seems to sway them from that that uh, that pursuit. There are very few. Pe- there are some who, like uh, Susan Blackmore and Richard Wiseman, who started out in parapsychology and who who have left. But for the most part, people continue to be persuaded of something there, and have to constantly find explanations for the difficulty in providing evidence, and also explanations for why it is the conventional scientific community isn't interested, right? And, I, and, and let me just say something about that for a second. It's always seemed interesting to me that in these incredibly uh, sensitive experiments that physicists do, uh, that no psychic effects have, no, no effects of the experimenter have ever shown up. That the anomaly doesn't show up in, in regular laboratories. Although scientists can study gravitational waves they, they can come to believe in things that are extraordinary that no one would have believed in initially, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum entanglement, uh, relativity theory. These things were originally rejected by a lot of scientists, but gradually they became convinced by evidence. So you don't see this kind of, this kind of anomaly developing in, physical labor- in physics laboratories. What you see is claims of it developing in 
some psychology department in Yale or somewhere uh, where a bunch of people are doing some really rather unsophisticated studies. So, so the side of, so that, so what do parapsychologists then say to, how do they explain the lack of interest by scientists? Uh, and I, I, I can't brand all parapsychologists by the, by the same brush, but, um, but I've, I've heard this thrown at me a number of times. It's fear. It's fear. My worldview will be upset. Or as uh, one parapsychologist said personally to me at one point, I, I have ESP ability, but it frightens me because it shows me what other people are thinking about me, and therefore I have to suppress it, and therefore I have to fight against the notion that exists to protect my own sanity. Those kinds of things don't impress scientists. It's an interesting question. Is the scientific community receptive to parapsychology or not? Uh, for example, the Parapsychological Association is formally affiliated with the American oh, Society. Yeah, Jeff, yeah? Jeff that, that's something that people trot out, but it doesn't mean a thing. This has to do with Margaret Mead arguing persuasively it should be an associate. That doesn't give it any credibility in, in the eyes of scientists. Well, let me, uh, let mean, me just finish my sentence. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, it, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, I want, I want to get that out, ha, has formally recognized the Parapsychological Association as a member organization. That occurred in 1969 by a, a vote of the executive committee. I think there were hundreds of people present when the vote was taken. But that's that's but that there's nothing about the phenomenon. They did not right. at that meeting say we accept that parapsychological phenomena are Th real. That's we correct. Yeah. yeah. But I, but I just want to bring it out because there is a measure of acceptance. But but I guess what I would say, Jeff, is I have no problem yeah. at all with people wanting to use scientific methods to study psychic phenomena. Mm -hmm. Right. I have no problem with that. I applaud them if they're going to be good scientists. The, the, the problem is that when you see people um, unwilling to 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 even suggest how they might disprove their notion, how you you see over and over again that any kind of evidence can be reinterpreted in such a way as to at least uh, give some hope that this supports Psy, then you have to say. Uh, why should the scientific community be interested in this? And I think I think this is an interesting point. At least I, I think it is. Parapsychologists, of course, are are wrapped up in in the the quest to show that science exists and convince the scientific world. Scientific world, it's it's not that it rejects science for the most part; it just ignores it. Mm -hmm. It's got no interest in it. I mean, you you go to any physicist in any level, and this is another thing, by the way. I had a physics colleague who who uh, really took parapsychology seriously. He was impressed by the research of Robert John mm -hmm. uh, at Princeton, former dean. Uh, he came to me and said, listen, you're a critic. I want you to give me all your – I'm going to show you what I'm doing in my experiment. Give me all your criticisms in advance. I don't want them after the fact. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And he set up an experiment, which I said, from my point of view – if you do this the way you've said you're going to do it, it looks pretty solid. Mm -hmm. He found nothing. He had continual support from Robert John. Uh, he tried it, tried it, tried it. He took it down to Princeton, tried it, got no results. Mm -hmm. And and that has disappeared. The, 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 you, you don't see any reference to him. Parapsychologists don't say, well, this should make us wonder whether these phenomena are real. They, it's just that was a failure. It doesn't count. Is, right? is that one of your colleagues at um, yes. York University? Stanley Jeffers. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm I'm familiar with that. It, yeah. it got published yeah. somewhere. I know I read that study. Well, well, that's right. But 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 what I'm saying is that it wasn't taken as you see. It, and and from my point of view, I reviewed very carefully all of Robert John's research, mm -hmm. and there were some very significant flaws in it that he mm -hmm. never corrected, even though they were pointed out to him. Uh, and and so Jeffers was very careful not to include those flaws. Yeah. And and I I guess all I'm saying is that. Uh, if, if parapsychologists um, clean up the methodology, well, it, it, often you find that the results they were getting no longer are there. And so there's an explanation for that. Uh, it can be the experimenter effect. It can be all sorts of things. Right. 
but but again, I get back to what what does it take to ever discourage a parapsychologist? And I can't think of anything. And my parapsychologist friend couldn't think of anything that would persuade him that it's not worth pursuing. I think it's fair to say you and I had, I thought, an excellent discussion in our previous conversation about belief systems and how hard they are to change. Sure. So, uh, in our conversation, I have no expectation that you're going to change my belief system or I'm going to change yours. And I, maybe that's not even the important thing because if we can try to pin down exactly what the empirical data is, uh, eventually people will apply good logic and reasoning and improve experiments and we can figure this out. Well, I think, I, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, but you know, one of the misunderstandings between these belief systems is the, is the following: yeah. uh, parapsychologists that I've talked to very often report feeling that the scientific community is hostile towards them. Yeah. My my view is that if there were some reliable evidence of psi, parapsychologists would be run down by the stampede of scientists wanting to establish it, wanting to exploit it, wanting to, because over the history of parapsychology, there have been a whole number of occasions mm -hmm. when when uh, mainstream psychologists have got involved. In fact, the very founding of, of the uh, both the Society for Psychical Research and the American Society for Psychical Research involved some psychologists. American Society for Psychical Research, some of those psychologists, uh, with the exception of William James, who stayed, others left and became very prominent members of the scientific psychology community in the United States. Mm -hmm. They left because they couldn't find any evidence. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, and, and then again, I think I, I don't have it at the tip of my, my, my tongue, but I think it was in the 1930s, American Psychological Association, uh, sometime around that time, organized a round table to look at parapsychology. And, and again, there was a wonderful opportunity, but the, but the, the data were, 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 are unpersuasive. So I actually am convinced that any reliable, because you know, you look at you look at again, look at mainstream science. Parapsychology, as odd as it is, because it seems to violate some very established laws of physics, uh, it's it, it's much less weird than quantum entanglement. It's much less weird than 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 uh, quantum mechanics in general, or the theory of relativity. I mean, these things yeah. are absolutely bizarre. The only reason scientists believe in them is, A, there's well-established mathematical theory that, that, that uh, encompasses them in, in, in a larger scientific model, and B, there's evidence over and over and over again that they, they work. And even then, by the way, as you know very well, um, scientists say, but, uh, you know, even though quantum mechanics and, and, and uh, the theory of relativity are the most highly successfully tested theories in all of humanity's history they're incompatible there's something wrong there's still something wrong there mm -hmm. and so scientists are are, are are puzzled by that seeking it out but they're, but they're not simply saying quantum mechanics is right because we say it's right psi exists because we say it exists what they're doing always is using evidence as the arbiter let's go into the evidence a little more deeply all right um Recently, um, the American Psychologist, which is the flagship journal of the American Psychological Association, and that's your profession, uh, published a review of uh, meta-analyses that incorporated, I think, some 1,700 parapsychology experiments, and uh, they point out that at a statistical level, the results are overwhelmingly significant. Well, a couple of things. That same organization published Daryl Bem's research, yes. which is the worst the worst research I've ever seen, research that I doubt ever would have made it into the pages of the Journal of Parapsychology, right? So so I, I'm absolutely disgusted with uh, the American Psychological Association's journal's decision. Uh -huh. So to me, that's... That's not a, 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 a huge pat in the back. Well, you Second, know what? Let, let me in, interrupt for just a second, Jim, because you mentioned Daryl Bem's research. And right. uh, for the benefit of our viewers, could you just summarize that? Well, uh, he, he, uh, an article was published by Daryl Bem in an APA journal um, in which he uh, reported a number of experiments 
that uh, uh, were, were kind of, I say, in a jumbled order, because as you read through it carefully, it turned out that, I, I don't remember exactly the details, but experiment one was actually experiment seven or eight, and it, it, it was a mishmash. Mm. The methodology was awful. Uh, but in this, he claimed to have evidence of, of some strong evidence of parapsychological phenomena, including uh, effects that uh, transversed uh, time and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wrote a, uh, a long criticism of this. Um, uh, he responded, I responded to him. Um, but the, to, to me, the shocking thing was that it was ever published. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I said in passing a moment ago, um, I gave a kudos to the Journal of Parapsychology because they, although I, I'm, I'm not saying that what they publish is uh, at, at, at the level of, of, of quote, proof, uh, they certainly have, have standards that would not have allowed that to be published. What you're saying is that, in your opinion, to the extent that the American Psychological Association, the APA, has been publishing favorable articles on parapsychology, it reflects poor judgment on their well, part. Well, look, the whole American Psychological Association is going a little strange. Uh -huh. They've recently published uh, 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 a position saying that uh, about toxic masculinity, for example, mm -hmm. and... Uh, if you read through it, they've said it, it, it would, it would, it, it, well, it's already raised a lot of hackles because it's a polemic, right? It's not based on research. Mm. So it, the organization, as, as you know, the, a number of people broke away from the American Psychological Association years ago and established the Association for Psychological Science because they were upset at the declining scientific standards of the organization. Yeah. So, I mean, this isn't the place for me to, to launch a, a critique of, of the American Psychological Association. All I am saying is that uh, it, 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 the fact that something is published in their journals is not uh, automatically a sign that it's good research. And I could, I could give you examples outside of parapsychology. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these I use in my class um, from, from good, supposedly good APA journals where the, 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 the claims made are absolutely unsupported by the data, but it's published anyway. I don't know what's happening with the editorial policies, yeah. but it's sloppy. Well, isn't it the case that uh, not just psychology, but throughout all the social and behavioral sciences, there's something of an uproar going on uh, around the issue uh, QRPs, or questionable research practices? Yes, you're right. And, you know, when I was a graduate student, my... my, my um, just to give you a bit of a background, I was I started out in physics, and I was actually accepted into graduate school in physics and changed my mind at the last minute and ended up in psychology. But one of the problems that I had once I was doing my graduate work in psychology and social psychology was the, the sloppiness of the techniques. And, and I used to, about once every few months, go to my supervisor and say, I'm quitting, and he would talk me out of it. But I've always been appalled by the by some of the sloppiness, and now it's happened in, in recent years, it's quite a, a scandal, some of the very best, in quotes, uh, social psychological experiments have been shown to be much less impressive than they appeared when they were published because uh, people got a hold of the research protocols or talked to people involved in the experiments, and it turns out that a lot of these things aren't replicable at all. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, um, and by the way, Jeff, I often, you know, I, I, I again, in, in discussions with parapsychologists, they'll say, well, what about your, your, your science is not so great. And I'll say, you're absolutely right. Don't emulate us. Don't emulate social psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, because we've got enough. And again, the, one of the problems that social psychology and parapsychology share is this heavy reliance on statistics, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where, 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 uh, a statistical deviation is taken to mean something particular. Mm -hmm. if with parapsychology, it's taken to mean that something psychic is going on. In, in social psychology, whatever the hap happened to be the hypothesis of the researcher uh, is confirmed. And it's, and much of the time, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of parapsychologists these days acknowledge that we don't understand 
what's going on. We don't have a, a good theory. If you talk about extrasensory perception, there's no organ of perception. There's no channel of communication. So they prefer to say what we have is an anomaly. Well, yeah, I, but I, I would, I would, I would sort of challenge that in a way. Mm-hmm. And I would say, I, I guess I would start out with this. I remember when I was in grade three or four, whenever you start learning a bit about science, we, we had these five or six steps of science. So mm-hmm. the very first one, it's the only one I remember, is define clearly the problem to be solved. Yeah. So if you look at ESP, what is the problem to be solved? Uh, presumably it's that, that some people get thoughts in their head uh, that were sent or, or correspond to thoughts that other people have, and it's not clear how they got there, right? Okay. So if, so, uh, if that's the problem, one of the interesting things to me is that we end up in modern parapsychology with uh, participants sitting in an experiment where, they, let's say, they, they're transmitting some thought to somebody else, and uh, uh, let's say the chance expectation is 50%, and... and uh, they run enough trials that 52% is, uh, is significant, mm-hmm. but they don't know which trials. You can't, you, you say to them, well, uh, you know, most of those trials you, were, you hit just by chance. Uh, 2% of the time you were above. Can you tell us which trial? Did you have some zing? Did you feel something? Well, they can't. They, they, they have no idea, right? So, so what, what, what is now the problem is that the statistical model has taken over from the original phenomenon of interest, mm-hmm. right? So... On the other hand, uh, if you look at um, um, and, and, and here, see, I, I, I happen to think that the the subjective phenomenon is important. Mm-hmm. That, that 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 so so you know it used to be in psychology, it's still to a large extent, uh, things like ESP are ignored completely. Right? Mm-hmm. They say, oh, that doesn't exist. We don't have to talk about it. Now most intro books will have a paragraph, you know, saying, well, some people might. But ever, mm-hmm. I teach a course on I call it the psychology of anomalous experience, and and I, I I what I do in this course is bring together psychological knowledge from all areas, perception, memory, uh, neuroscience, and so forth, to to explain how these phenomena could not say they do could occur naturally, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and how they would appear to be parapsychological. And so I say to my students. The way our brains work, every one of us should expect from time to time to have experiences that, that seem paranormal, even if there is no such thing as, as psychic uh, phenomena. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so getting back to that question of what, what is the problem to be solved, to me, uh, this is the more interesting thing. How is it that some people or, or all of us from time to time have these experiences and I think what we, what the tendency to do is I can't I can't think of the explanation therefore it's it's psychic, and then saying it's psychic doesn't explain anything it's simply a label saying I can't think of an explanation it can't be normal, right? Uh, of course, there's a whole history of uh, field studies uh, that go back uh, into the 1880s or so, perhaps even earlier. In fact, I think even Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, attempted to conduct something of a a field study analysis of Immanuel Swedenborg, who was a mystic back in the 18th century. But in in any case, field studies do provide a lot of uh, visual description or content-oriented description. So, uh, you know, parapsychologists would say we have empirical data that's been accumulated over nearly 150 years. Uh, we don't want to just discard it. it. It's not necessarily all the result of some sort of conceptual errors. Well, you know, you, you um, I'm sure, are familiar with John Beloff. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You know, and I, I've met John Beloff a few times. Yeah. Uh, years ago, um, I wrote a, a target article for the journal Be- Behavior and Brain Sciences, and mm-hmm. a whole number of people were invited to respond. And John Beloff responded, to my surprise, essentially agreeing with me. Mm-hmm. So when I, when I talked to him personally, I said, and he told me that at that time, although he had a fair amount of money made available to him to do research, he himself at that time mm-hmm. had never found any evidence to decide. Right. And, and uh, his um, fellow parapsychologists were saying, well, that's not surprising because of his personality. He's not psych-conducive, etc. Yeah. But, but I said, then why, 
Why do you continue to believe? He said, I believe because of D.D. Hume, mm-hmm. the man who floated up to the ceiling in, in 1800s. Yeah. And I said, but, but that's just anecdotal. He said, well, the, the people who reported this were all gentlemen of good standing. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't lie. And I found that really interesting, that here he was as critical of, as I of the em- empirical data. Right. But he was willing to base his belief on this demonstration because Englishmen, gentlemen, wouldn't lie. Uh-huh. And, I, and I think this is part of the problem, that historical data. So you remember the census of hallucinations. Uh, or I think that was the term of it, uh, the Society for Psychic Research. Back in the up. 19th century. <clears throat> and uh, I remember one of the things that was interesting, and it's been some time since I've read it, so I may have some of the details wrong, but one of the things that they were clever enough to do in those days was to take these accounts, and again, they tried to find people of good standing that they could trust. I mean, they wouldn't take interviews with the rabble, who knows, they may not tell the truth. But uh, And then whenever they could, they would check these details. Yeah. And as we recall, there was a, a, one of the cases they mentioned, uh, I, I think his name was a Judge Hornby, who was a, a British judge serving in Hong Kong. He reported an incident of a, of a reporter. <clears throat> Apparently in those days, reporters would come to a judge the night before a, a verdict was given in a murder trial, and, and he would give them the information, because it took so long to set up the presses, that by the time that they got their newspapers out, the, the verdict would already have been delivered. And he mentioned that he and his wife were awakened by a knock at 2 in the morning, uh, and here was a reporter. He was very upset. This guy shouldn't be coming so late. And the guy promised, I'll, you know, I'll never, I'll never bother you again, judge, but it, this is really important. Anyway... Story goes, Judge Hornby said that um, he found out the next day that the reporter had died just shortly before 2 a.m. So when they checked the story out, they had a lot to go on. They, they, he knew the, the case. He knew the reporter's name. Uh, I, it turned out that at the time of that particular trial, he had not been married yet, so his wife couldn't have been there. He had all the details wrong. And when he was confronted with this, he said, I can't, he said, I, I have to believe you, but I'm yeah. astonished. Mm-hmm. At how, so... So one of the things I really respected that report for was that they, they, they were perhaps the first to say we have to be extremely careful about anecdotal evidence. Mm-hmm. Because even people of the highest standing with the greatest conviction in their accounts can be quite wrong. I, I think it's probably fair to say that social standing is not necessarily highly correlated with honesty. I agree with you. But also, but in this case... Just, just the whole, the whole notion. We know these days yeah. about the vagaries of memory, mm-hmm. and in those yeah. days, that was something that, that was was not really understood. Well, I, as, as I recall, though, the uh, uh, earlier researchers in the Society for Psychical Research were very careful to uh, find corroborating evidence whenever they could. Yeah, that, that's what that's what I was saying, Jeff. Yeah. But, but 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 if you look at that, at least my recollection of it mm-hmm. is. They found many instances where they were surprised, and the and the person providing the anecdote was surprised. Sure, that that, that the memory could not be corroborated, yeah. or key elements of it uh-huh. couldn't be. But looking so I'm, I'm looking back that, today, that wouldn't be so surprising, would it? No, today we understand that yeah. that uh, that, uh, that you know conviction in the in the accuracy of your memory has nothing to do with the actual accuracy of your memory. Mm-hmm. I yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what what you're saying is that uh, the case studies are are vulnerable to that criticism. Yeah, and I think basically they're they're in a sense irrelevant to if 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 we talk about establishing this phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, what will persuade the scientific community is evidence, yeah. and it's not going to be evidence based on things done 40 years ago, 100 years ago. It's going to be based on what can you do right now. I mean, take, for example, the cold fusion studies, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, with uh, the, the notion that these these two very distinguished chemists mm-hmm. had produced cold fusion uh, tabletop apparatus. Uh, within a couple of months, all kinds of, of replications were attempted around the world. Uh, they failed, and in the meantime, people came up with explanations as to what had gone wrong in the original study. Mm-hmm. So so uh, the, the only way out of this for parapsychologists is to say, as some of them do, that, well, psychic phenomena are different. They, they, can't, they can't be fit into this scientific 
paradigm. And yes, some, case, some do claim that. Yeah, and mm. if that's the case, then, you know, there's nothing really more to say from, from the scientific side, mm. right? It, it's, it's like, uh, but, you know, I want to get back for a moment to this statistical thing, because sure. uh, uh, it's always bothered me, both in psychology and in parapsychology, that, uh, you know, rejection of a null hypothesis or whatever is taken as evidence of a particular interpretation. So mm -hmm. one of the examples I like, uh, <clears throat> there was a study done a few years ago where uh, cardiac patients were divided into two groups mm -hmm. in a cardiac unit. Uh, they didn't know they were involved in this. The idea was that they were um, sort of matched in terms of, of uh, severity of their condition. And then uh, one half of them were prayed over and the other half weren't. And so uh, it turned out, so the study claimed, although the, the, it, it, ultimately some flaws in the analysis were discovered, that the people who had been prayed over recovered more quickly and had fewer consequences yeah. than those who weren't prayed over. Now, my point is that they're saying, okay, there's a statistical difference. That's because God jumped in. Uh-huh. Uh, it could just as easily be said that, no, this is psychokinesis, right? The statistical deviation doesn't tell us what's causing it. Right. It could be methodological sloppiness, too. That's right. That That's pretty clear. Statistics will will show you if there's a difference between one population and, a, and another population or between one population and uh, probability theories, <laughs> uh, chance expectations. <laughs> But but you need much more than statistics to develop a a model for how the phenomenon occurs. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I think you know uh, it's interesting to me, Jim, that we're largely in agreement about many of these issues. I think so. Mm -hmm. The the real uh, question is, uh, I suppose, do you hold a metaphysical position or a philosophical position that uh, that would tell you that these phenomena are impossible? In terms of impossibility, I don't think anything. I, I would never brand anything impossible. Okay. Right, because um, to me, if I were to do that, then I would say quantum entanglement is impossible. Or, yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But sure. I accept based on the evidence that this is, this is genuine. Mm -hmm. What What I think the challenge is that I look at uh, every known um, uh, energy source. Every kind of wave follows certain rules in, in physics, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so the notion that that parapsychological forces aren't diminished by distance, they're not affected by time, uh, says to me that it's really unlikely that these are real. That's fair enough. I think yeah. most people growing up in a Western culture uh, are uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, in fact, I think even in ancient times, there, there isn't there the, a biblical quote by St. Paul, you know, when I was a child, I believed in childish things, but now that I'm an adult, I, right. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, since ancient times, people have been uh, wary of claims of the supernatural. Sure, but, but I guess I'm going to step beyond that. I, uh -huh. I'm, because the, the, their wariness is based on probably something metaphysical. What I'm saying is, uh, if you look at the history of science, yeah. going, going back to, to well, 1600s, 1700s, and so forth, one of the big challenges was to overcome the tendency to think in terms of magic. Mm -hmm. right? And 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 so these various, the, the, this whole notion of replication and so forth became... Uh, a keystone to protecting us from self-deception, self-delusion, yeah. right. and collective delusion. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what, what I'm saying is I try my best not to be deluded about things. Sure. So uh, none of us can guarantee we won't be deluded. But what we can do, I, I, I start with the principle that um, uh, the, the, the science that we've accumulated um, – is a is is a good guide. It's not a, not a perfect guide, but a good guide to to reality. Mm -hmm. And so we find something that that uh, that violates completely the 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 science that we have have, have developed. 
then we we got to be very cautious about accepting it. We want some pretty good evidence, mm-hmm. and and so when you end up with things being defined statistically, or even worse, I mean, I I'm very critical about meta analyses in general, uh-huh. other than parapsychology or anywhere else. If, if if that's how you're establishing something, I would say to myself, is that is that a good enough evidence to to to, to for me to say that okay the um, these various laws of physics uh, don't always apply. And, and I'm simply saying, no, it's not. Well, let me ask you this. What about the uh, evidence that's been put forward uh, in the parapsychology community for practical applications? Uh, you know, the government remote viewing program or applications of remote viewing in archaeology, for example, where they claim that remote viewers have been able to directly guide archaeologists to where to dig under the sands in the Sahara Desert, and they, they dig and they find exactly what uh, the remote viewers have described at those locations. So if that's the case, then I presume all archaeologists are now using remote viewers. It only makes sense. Well, um, to my knowledge, uh, it hasn't really been uh, picked up very much in the archaeology community, but in your country, in, in Canada, I believe his name was Emerson. I think he's regarded as the dean of Canadian archaeologists, has, has worked extensively uh, that way. I would grant you this. If, in fact, one can demonstrate that they are actually doing what is reported, then that is yeah. that is evidence that he's looking at. Yeah. I also remind you, there are all kinds of people who use dowsing to yeah. find water, to find oil, to yeah. find gold, yeah. to find lost children. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you really look at the dowsing evidence, it turns out there's really nothing there. So uh, I'm not familiar with the psychic archaeology, but I mm-hmm. my... Uh, if I had to bet on it, I would bet that it's something similar to dowsing in that regard. Well, However, yeah. the challenge for parapsychologists is to to provide good evidence, and 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 if if that's going to be the path of good evidence, then then let it be so. Yeah. But as you know very well, if you look at the history of parapsychology, the paradigm just keeps shifting. What seems to be good evidence in the 1930s is no longer talked about now. Robert John's research, which was considered at least by some people to be the most sophisticated ever, no one talks about that anymore. Well, well don't, don't say no one, because I have recently done uh, video interviews with people on both of those topics. So, okay. I think that old, that old, uh, those old studies are, are worth, uh, consideration. Okay. They, uh, those old studies are also plagued by errors. Right. I mean, I, I personally went through everything that, at the time I did my, my research on this, every study John had done, yeah. every study that the physicist Helmut Schmidt had done. Mm-hmm. And and the flaws were very obvious. And and the question always was, why not do this without the flaws? Why not repeat it without the flaws? Yeah. Now, I um, haven't gone into the details of your right. critiques of, of these studies with the random event generators. Right. Uh, I, so I, I'd love to get into the details with you. Maybe we could do that. On an, uh, uh, well, no, let's, let's get into it. What, what are some of the flaws that well, you found? Uh, this is, I, I have to go by memory, Jeff. I haven't okay. looked at these but, but if, Even, <coughs> even so, of, I think it'll be of benefit to our viewers. In the case of Robert John, yeah. he used what was called a tri- um, tripolar protocol. I think I've got the right term. Mm-hmm. So, participant sits in front of the computer. The computer, uh, 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 a number shows up on the screen right. uh, derived by a random event generator. On on some of the trials, a third of the trials, the, the participant is asked to try to get the number high. Right. I don't remember what the range was. Let's say it was from 1 to 100. So, mm-hmm. you want to get numbers over over 50. Okay. And, and, and a third of the trials, you want to get them low. Yeah. And the other third of the trials, you, you rest. Mm-hmm. This is control. Yeah. So, first thing I noticed looking at the data was that, uh, and I, again, I don't remember the exact number, so I'm making up numbers. Okay. But it was, uh, say, in the, in the high condition, there are 293,640 trials, and the low condition, condition, there are 223,170 trials. In the control condition, there's 190,670 trials. Okay. First thing a psychologist says is, why are they different? Yeah. Why would you have equal number of trials? Second thing, 
And John himself had pointed this out that the control trials were the the the, the mean was the, they were the, the distribution of scores was too close to the mean. They were too good. Mm -hmm. And he said. Well, that's probably because on the control trials, even though they don't know it, unconsciously they're trying to push the random event generator towards... Yes. The in fact, I recently interviewed Roger Nelson, who was at that laboratory, and he made that exact point. Yeah. And I said to, to, to John, in writing as well as personally, you know, it's, it's strange. I mean, you, you, you see these, it's like going into a chemistry lab and, and seeing chemicals slopped around on the, on the surface of the table. You say... Who's, who's running this experiment? First of all, why would you have so many, uh, such different numbers of trials? Secondly, it's interesting that the fewest trials were in the control condition. What if, I said, what if on the control condition, somebody behind the scenes could say, wow, on the control condition, we got a 94. Wouldn't that be good to put in the hopper for the high? Mm -hmm. Oh, here's... 22. Wouldn't that be good to go in the hopper low? So what you'd end up with would be strange numbers with the fewest in the control condition and the standard deviation of the control trials would be much too close. Right. Now, uh, of course, he bridled at this because that suggests some kind of fraud. Well, it turns out John Palmer, a leading parapsychologist, had also examined these data. And he was the one that discovered that if you took out one participant one participant scores, the, there was no significance in the overall data. And guess what? That one participant was the researcher herself who ran, conducted, designed the experiment. Absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. The other thing was they kept accumulating data. They never started from scratch and said, let's do it again. Let's do a clean run. He would never do that. Uh, the, so so, so that, that's just a, what comes back to memory. There are other things mm -hmm. as well. I can't remember the details now. It's been a long time. Yeah. But you can see what I'm getting at. That, yeah. That yeah. Uh, the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole business, um, and I must, uh, I, uh, there, there was a funny thing that happened. Uh, um, at one point, uh, uh, another psychologist, critic, you know him, Ray Hyman, and yes. I were invited to a meeting in Washington uh, we were told that this was to be uh, a, a collection of, of skeptics and parapsychologists who were going to discuss, you know, where should parapsychology be going if it wants to establish itself. It had been set up by Senator Claiborne Pell of Rhode Island, who himself was quite uh, a supporter of parapsychological research. Mm -hmm. And we went around the table, and there was at each, we were in a horseshoe-shaped table. Ray was at one end of the horseshoe, I at the other. John Palmer, the parapsychologist, was there. Marcello Truzzi, who, who sort of played both sides in a way. I mean, he, he sometimes said he was a skeptic, sometimes a believer. It's hard to know. Um, I say that with all due respect because I quite liked him. Um, Daryl Bem was there. Mm -hmm. And Daryl Bem at this point had never published anything in parapsychology, and we assumed that he must be one of the skeptics, although when he, when he stood up to introduce himself, he identified as being very supportive of parapsychology. Anyway... So when Ray and I are the only, quote, skeptics there of the six or eight people, at any rate, uh, Robert John, uh, it was kind of a, <laughs> a little ways like an inquisition, I thought. Robert John got up to, um, to speak um, uh, to us. There was an audience of, I don't know who was in the audience, and he, he took uh, exception to these criticisms of his study and particularly the notion that uh, there may have been some uh, deception, some cheating by the person who ran the experiment. And I'm thinking, okay, he's criticizing me because I've pointed this out. Mm -hmm. Ray thought he was criticizing him. So suddenly John Palmer stands up. He says, on a point of personal privilege, I, I, I absolutely reject these accusations. <laughs> and I found it really amusing because John Palmer and I had actually agreed in our criticisms mm -hmm. of, of John. Um, so, even even a, a leading parapsychologist was critical of that of that data, and I, right. I, I understand. And I, I don't know this as a fact. It's been said to me. I pre mm -hmm. presume it's true, but I don't know that John had tried to publish his research in the Journal of Parapsychology, and they rejected it. Oh, uh, now I, I, I've been told that, so I don't. I can't swear to that. Yeah. But but the problem is that 
these inherent difficulties were there. It's very serious difficulties. Yeah. And if people are still talking about this as good research, then they're, 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 they're deceiving themselves. Well, I think uh, one of the things this story points out is uh, that parapsychologists like John Palmer can be incredibly uh, critical of each other's work. Uh, the uh, parapsychologists tend to scrutinize each other e- extremely rigorously. Well, they they do, and I give them credit for that. Mm-hmm. You, you know, I, I, and but but so, so to the extent that that's done, the only problem is that. It, nothing really seems to change very much, right? John did not change his research procedures. Helmut Schmidt never changed his. He kept doing things that, that were outrageous. Daryl Bem never changed what he's doing. Um, so it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I think what, what struck me, the first time I went to a parapsychology conference, I think it was in Dallas. I remember meeting John Beloff and Scott Rogo and a number of other people, mm-hmm. John Palmer, I guess, uh, what, what struck me as I, as I started to feel more accepted after mm-hmm. the initial cold, warm, uh, cold handshakes I was getting, uh, was that there was a lot of disagreement amongst people. So I talked to one parapsychologist who believed that uh, people can set paper on fire by staring at it. Talked to another parapsychologist about that. He said, oh, that's nonsense. I don't believe in that for a second. <laughs> and I found that it, it wasn't clear to me whether uh, if you – shared all the beliefs that everybody had, how many that would be endorsed by the whole group, right? Well, don't so you think I, that would also a be willingness, true a of the skeptical group? Pardon? I, There's I, a willingness to be generous, not to laugh at other people's ideas. Yeah. You, may not, you may not agree with them. Sure. But it seemed like the important thing was to say we're all in the same boat together, right? Mm-hmm. And we may not agree on the details, but, you know, we don't, we don't want to uh, shame people either. Yeah. I would imagine if I attended a conference of one of the skeptical organizations, you'd find the same range of beliefs. Um, I don't know. I think the, the skeptical organizations, if there's a problem there, it's that, that people, that some of the attendees um, are unwilling to be generous at all. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. I mean, one of my heroes and, and a very good friend is Ray Hyman. Uh, and, and Ray is the fairest minded person I know in terms of, of thinking about parapsychology and so forth, even though he sees absolutely no evidence that th- this exists, right? Mm-hmm. But I remember once he gave a talk where at a skeptics meeting, and he was saying, listen, you know, you've got to distinguish between parapsychologists who are seriously trying to apply scientific principles they may not be doing it correctly we could argue about that but you got to distinguish between them and, and people who are out there you know lighting paper on fire by staring at it or whatever right yeah. and 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 i happen to be in the audience and and this person beside me said ray's gone soft what's wrong ray's gone soft right and it was somehow <laughs> so 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 you, you know i don't like and i've i've always uh, I, in giving talks to skeptics i've always tried to point out that just because we call ourselves skeptics, we, we don't have any monopoly on, on truth or wisdom, and that we all have similar brains. We all are capable of the same delusions <laughs> that others are. And, and uh, it, it really bothers me to see some skeptics who, who are convinced they're rational beings they will never make mistakes, and I think that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I always say, listen, I've probably got a lot of beliefs that are false, I just can't sort them out because they seem just as true as the ones that probably are true. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I think it, to, to me what what the skeptical organizations should be doing and, and 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 to some extent do do is 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 promote rational inquiry, rational examination of claims. Mm-hmm. Should not be uh, uh, saying that's nonsense because it's it's. Uh, occult or psychic or religious or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we can't. We shouldn't. Can't do that. And 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 I think good skeptics don't do that. Uh, Doctor James Alcock, this has been a, a very uh, productive discussion, as far as I'm concerned. I think I uh, learned a few things, uh, and I'm certainly very happy to share your point of view with our viewing audience. I think everybody can benefit from it. Well, Jeff, this has been our second interview, and I've enjoyed both of them. And I and I respect your your uh, your your honesty and your approach to 
you know, allowing me to say what I want to say and and uh, accepting it and accepting that we can agree to disagree on some things. Well, thank you so much for being with me, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.